Sorry, I think we're having some audio issues, so I just don't want to continue this discussion without the public hearing. So I'm just going to mute and we're going to take a bit of a recess. Can you hear me there, Jesse? Yep, yeah. we, can hear, we can hear you. You're still having trouble hearing us, Steve? I can hear you perfectly. I can't hear council very well at all. I can't either, Jess. I can hear Chelsea fine as well. Yeah, I can hear Chelsea and Steve and Jesse. Uh, the rest of it's just all garbled. Carol, can you speak again and see if this is better? No. <laughs>
Um, Deputy Mayor Winterhorn, can we just test the speakers to make sure that we're are we all good, Bianca? Um, I can only hear you. No. Okay, we'll test again. Deputy Mayor Wendover, can you? Testing, testing. Yeah, that's better. Oh, good. Crisis averted. Yep. So we'll again. go back to the opportunity interest or roll call. Which, which one? Um, yep, I, I'll I'll start with the roll call then. Okay. We'll go back to the roll call. Okay. Yep. Deputy Mayor Windover, are you present? Present. Councillor Armstrong? Present. Councillor Franzen? Present. Councillor Lanthead? Present. And uh, Mayor Clarkson has sent her regrets. For staff, we have Donna Taggart, CAO Treasurer. Present. Steve Rockbank, Director of Emergency Services. Present. Evan Grieger, Director of Public Works. Present. Barb Waldron, Director of Building and Planning, CBO. Present. Adele Arbor, Planner. Present. Sarah Dillamarder, Junior Planner. Present. Uh, Chelsea Carpenter, Public Works Waste Management Coordinator. Present. Bianca Dragicevic, Temporary Records Coordinator. Present. Thank you. I remind the council members of the obligation to declare any permanent interest that they may have. We get a motion. I'd like to declare a, a conflict of interest. Oh. That's the discussion that we're having for the water system at Paris Glen now from Village. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we get a motion to uh, approve the agenda. Terry and Carol. Uh, All in favor? Pass. Carry. Yep. Okay. We get the motion for the minutes. Adoption regular council meeting of February 15th. The statutory public meetings February the 15th. The motion. Carol, thank you, Carol. Peter, thank you very much, seconder. All in favor? Good. Pass. The minutes and reports from the committee and board members, Economic Development Advisory Committee, February 14th. Library board January 14th. Get a motion. Motion. Okay, yes, Peter. Motion to receive. Receive. Terry, second it. All in favor? Terry, thank you. Liaison resort for council board of committees. Ask any liaison reports from these committees. Thank yes, you. Uh, to you, Deputy Mayor. Um, for the library, uh, just announcing that starting March 9th, library, libraries will be open for in-person visits. Um, hoping to open the Goodbye Room on March 25th, as long as it is safe to do so. Um, and they continue to have take-home crafts at the Buckhorn Branch. Uh, also, youth group is running every Tuesday at the Cavendish Community Center. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other? Okay. That's a sorry public meeting. Who's got a motion to second this? What she said? No. no okay. That's a sorry public meeting pursuant to the Development Charge Act. Get a motion for that. Are there any comments? Motion to suspend a regular meeting and, and move into a public meeting. Okay. Second there. I'll Carol, second thank you. All in favor? Gary. So, um, I'm Mitchell Stevenson, Managing Partner, Watson Associates, Development Charges Update Study. Any member to speak on that? To you, Sean Michael is on, and I believe he'll be making a presentation.
Regardez. Good afternoon. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Good, good afternoon, uh, Deputy Mayor, members of Council. Um, so, if you could uh, advance the slide forward, please. <coughs> Excuse me. So, just as a, a quick introduction, this meeting, this public meeting, is a mandatory requirement under the Development Charges Act before. A council can consider the passage of a development charge bylaw, including an amendment to an existing development charge bylaw. And the intent of the meeting today is to provide a brief overview of the uh, proposed amendment and to receive uh, any public input on the matter. Uh, council will not be asked to make uh, any decisions uh, today. The bylaw will be coming um, back to council for their consideration at a later date. Well, next slide, please. In terms of a bit of the background around the uh, development charge um, background study um, process in the municipality um, and with regards to this amendment in 2019, um, a background study uh, was prepared uh, comprehensively and that led to the passage of bylaw B 2019 041. Uh, and then the amendment that's being brought forward uh, for council's uh, consideration uh, and overview today uh, is in response to two um, main areas. And so one is in response to changes to the uh, Development Charges Act, the governing uh, authority for municipalities imposed development charges that was made to the More Homes, More Choice Act as well as the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Act. And as I'll discuss in a little bit more detail, those changes relate to uh, increases in the development charge recoverable capital costs that can be included in the calculation of the charge with um, the removal of the 10% statutory deduction, as well as some changes to the eligible services that can be included in a development charge background uh, and some technical changes around how growth related studies are treated within the calculation. Uh, and then as well uh, within the act, there are also changes to the uh, requirements around when development charges are calculated and collected, as well as a statutory exemptions to the payment of development charges. And then lastly, there have been some uh, minor revisions to the development charge redevelopment credit policy to non-statutory uh, exemptions as well. But other than those um, components of the bylaw that I'll review today, all of the components of the existing DC bylaw will remain unchanged. So first, in terms of the changes to the development charge eligible costs, so previously in the prescribed methodology in the act, uh, once the growth related costs were determined for uh, certain services such as parks and recreation, uh, library and studies, uh, municipalities were required to make a further 10% deduction to those growth related costs before calculating the charge. Uh, that required 10% deduction has been removed uh, from the act, thereby allowing municipalities to cover a greater share of the growth related capital costs from new development. Uh, as well, there's been a, a reallocation of the uh, service, service specific growth related uh, studies uh, within the, the various service areas within the background studies, more of a technical uh, change in that regard. And then, as a, lastly, um, the Act now identifies a, a defined list of services that are eligible to be included in a development charge background study and bylaw. Uh, that list no longer includes municipal parking services, which was a service included in the current bylaw. And so with this uh, amendment, uh, municipal parking services will be removed from the calculation. And so what's shown in the table on the bottom of the slide is that uh, in total, across the various service areas, um, approximately one and a half percent additional capital costs have been included in the calculation of the charge, an increase of uh, just over $37,000 over the respective forecast periods. Next slide, please. 
So the with um, that change, then the proposed schedule of charge in the amendment is presented here. Um, the structure of that charge is unchanged from the current bylaw, in which the residential charge is imposed uh, per dwelling unit, that being for single and semi-detached dwellings, uh, for apartment units, and for any other multiples. And then the non-residential charge is imposed. Uh, on a per square meter of gross floor area basis for uh, aggregate developments and non-aggregate developments, and then on a per 500 kilowatts and nameplate generating capacity basis for green energy developments such as uh, solar farms and wind turbines. Um, now with the, uh, the changes to the charge, the, the fully calculated charge is uh, recommended for a residential development as well as area developments and uh, green energy developments. However, for non-residential uh, developments excluding aggregates, the when the 2019 bylaw was passed, a council elected to set that charge lower than the fully calculated amount. Um, what's being uh, recommended in this amendment uh, through discussions uh, with staff is to increase the charge for the non-aggregate non-residential developments by 20% to allow for some additional cost recovery while still remaining competitive with neighboring municipalities as we'll see in the um, following slides. Uh, next slide please. Uh, and again. Um, so the three tables here on the screen now, they compare the uh, current charges that are in place in the municipality to the proposed charges in the amendment. And so on the top table for a single detached residential dwelling unit, we can see that across uh, the, the six service areas, the total charge is $5,433 per dwelling unit. Uh, with the uh, amendment, that charge would increase by about $56 per unit to $5,488, an increase of about 1% in that total charge paid. Uh, when we look at the uh, total charge for aggregates, there would actually be a minor reduction in that charge on a per square meter of gross floor area basis, decreasing by about three cents per square meter. And then looking at the charge um, excluding aggregate developments, that the maximum charge that could be imposed would be the uh, $60.30 that's uh, recommended for aggregate developments. However, the uh, recommendation is to increase by approximately 20% from $13.70 per square meter of growth flow area for commercial, institutional, industrial developments to $16.38, uh, an increase of about $2.70 per square meter or again, a roughly a 20% increase in that charge. Next slide, please. So then just to give a, a representation of how that uh, increase impacts the relative uh, competitiveness of the uh, DC policies uh, within the municipality, What's presented here is the, the total development charges payable, uh, including the charges that might be applicable for upper tier levels of government as represented in the uh, orange section of the bars. Um, and so, and then what those total charges are in municipality as well as surrounding uh, municipalities uh, in the geographic area. And so with the approximate 1% increase in the uh, municipality's development charge, that would equate to about a less than a half a percent increase in the total charge payable, uh, including uh, the county charges. And obviously as shown here uh, by the gray and green arrows, not changing the relative uh, position of the municipality, still above that and so and below that in Cramay and Duro Drummer, for example. Next slide, please. Looking at uh, commercial development, uh, we can see that with the 20% increase in the non-residential charge for the municipality, that would equate to about a 10% increase uh, in the overall charge. Um, however, that would not change the relative competitiveness of a uh, municipality's charge, still remaining at the bottom end of the comparison below that of Selwyn, above that uh, slightly of Asphodel Norwood. Uh, next slide, please. 
Then lastly, looking at industrial uh, development, how the, um, the position of the municipality is slightly more towards the, the mid-range based on uh, other municipalities' uh, specific industrial development charge policies. However, again, the 10% the increase in the overall development charges payable, including both the upper and lower tier charges, would not change that relative competitive uh, position. Next slide, please. And so as I mentioned earlier, except for uh, the specific um, charges and policies identified uh, in the uh, addendum to the background study, um, all other aspects of the current bylaw would remain unchanged. Um, some of the changes in terms of the development charge bylaw policies are being driven by changes in the legislation around the timing of when development charges would be calculated and collected. And so currently, uh, or previously in the um, municipality's development charge bylaw, development charges are both calculated and collected at the time of building permit issuance. That is, it still remains the default provision under the Development Charges Act. However, as of January 1st, uh, 2020, uh, with uh, change to the act stemming from the More Home with More Choice Act, um, there, there are now uh, some changes for specific types of developments to when uh, the, the charges would be calculated and collected. And so firstly, um, for rental housing and institutional developments as defined in the regulation, those charges are now required to be paid in six equal annual payments commencing with the date of occupancy. Uh, and then for nonprofit housing, those charges will be paid in 21 equal annual payments, again, commencing the date of occupancy. So um, providing for mandatory uh, deferred payments uh, for those qualifying developments. And then for any developments that proceed through either the site plan or zoning bylaw amendment uh, application approvals processes, their charges will now be calculated on the day that planning application is made held frozen at that rate until the time of building permit issuance um, as long as that building permit is issued within two years of the approval of the planning application um, and this policy providing uh, the calculation of the charge earlier in the development approvals process provides some additional uh, cost assurances to uh, applicants in terms of what their charge will be as they go through that planning approvals process. And so these mean statutory requirements that, that must be witnessed and, and are already in effect, but will be included in the amending bylaw for clarity. With regards to the uh, those frozen payments or frozen calculated charges and the installment payments, the Act allows municipalities to charge interest uh, in that regard. And so what's being proposed uh, to be included in the amending bylaw is that interest would be charged at the Bank of Canada prime lending rate plus 2% uh, and that, um, that charge being imposed to uh, reflect the short-term borrowing costs of the municipality. That rate would be determined on January 1st of each year for any uh, qualifying uh, developments over the following uh, one year period and that interest rate would be fixed throughout the duration of the installment payment so that that um, repayment schedule is known for administrative ease and understanding from the applicant standpoint. Um, the one exception to that interest uh, policy is that there would be no additional interest imposed for nonprofit housing. Next slide, please. Um, so there are uh, statutory exemptions to the payment of development charges that are identified in the Act. Uh, there are a couple changes to those exemptions that, that came into effect uh, in September of 2020, and that will also be included uh, in the bylaw. Those include that um, where previously uh, for existing residential housing, uh, you could add up to two additional apartment units within the existing building and there wouldn't be no development charges payable. That exemption now extends to additional apartment units that are created in ancillary structures to the existing residential building. So, so now a um, additional apartment unit created in a detached garage uh, that is ancillary to an existing residential building would now be exempt, for example. Uh, 
and then as well a new statutory exemption is that um, for a new residential buildings that are um, created on uh, lots that were created through the plan of subdivision of consent process um, the the new residential building can contain a second dwelling unit either with the in or ancillary to the new residential building and the second dwelling unit would be exempt and then lastly uh, development of any lands intended for use by a university has received operating funds from the government would also be exempt um, under the development charges act and so those exemptions being included in the amended bylaw so there are also non-statutory exemptions included uh, in the municipality's development charge bylaw that are there at council's uh, discretion um, one of those exemptions is for bona fide uh, farm buildings, which are exempt from the payment of development charges. Uh, it's proposed that that exemption would continue to be maintained. However, uh, the definitions uh, for that uh, exemption are being clarified uh, or expanded to clarify what types of uses that might occur on an agricultural on agricultural lands would not be exempt from the payment of charges. And so being clear to identify that uses such as wholesale or retail facilities, restaurants, uh, farm shops, bank facilities, uh, hospitality and accommodation facilities, gift shops, uh, grooming services, breeding, household pets and marijuana or alcohol processing production facilities would not be exempt and are not part of a bona fide farming uh, building. Next slide, please. And then lastly, with uh, redevelopment credits. So uh, redevelopment credits are currently in the municipality's uh, bylaw. They're generally included in uh, most municipal charge bylaws across the province. And what they're meant to do is reflect that where you are demolishing and replacing an existing use or converting it to a new use, uh, the replacement of the existing use doesn't reflect or represent an increase in need for service and therefore there should be no development charges payable with respect to replacing an existing use. Uh, one uh, clarifying policy to that uh, re to that redevelopment credit uh, provision is that um, in when the 2019 bylaw was passed uh, it made clear that development charges would be payable for park model trailers. Um, and so that came in that policy being uh, clarified as of April 16th, 2019. And so what's being clarified in the redevelopment credit policy is that if after that date, development charges weren't paid for a park model trailer that should have been, um, if that park model trailer is uh, removed and replaced, there would be no uh, redevelopment credit applicable because there was no development charge paid when there should have been initially. Uh, next slide, please. And so lastly, in terms of uh, next steps in the process, Council have the opportunity to receive any uh, input uh, from the public on the matter. Um, and then the, uh, the update study and the amending bylaw will come forward to Council for their consideration at the April 5th, uh, 2022 Council meeting um, with the bylaw proposed to come into effect uh, at the time of passage. So that does conclude my presentation. If there are any uh, questions uh, from council, I'd be happy to assist. Any questions? Yes, Peter. I have, I have one question. Uh, uh, when you did the neighboring, the comparison with neighboring municipalities, I was curious why you didn't include any of the municipalities now in uh, Halliburton Township or Halliburton County. Uh, they're uh, directly adjoining to our municipality. Um, so the one that weren't they weren't included there. Um, I'd have to double check, but I believe it's because they don't have development charges. Thank you, Pam. Any other? Yes, go yes ahead. thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, two questions, neither of which really impact the uh, amended bylaw. But um, the first one is. Does any municipality charge development charges for residential uh, based on square meter? It seems to me you can make a distinction between somebody building a 1500 square, sorry, square foot building and somebody else building a 
5,000 square foot building. Does any municipality do that? Um, there are some municipalities that uh, differentiate their um, apartment dwelling charges, for example, based on square footage, size of the apartment. Um, we don't recommend that because the within the methodology, we're looking at what is the increase in need for service on a per capita basis, and then converting that to a char a per dwelling unit charge based on the assumed occupancy assumptions of those dwelling unit types from census data. And um, what we and what the data shows is that there's not a correlation between a larger single family home and an increased occupancy of that home. And so an increased home doesn't necessarily mean a higher underlying occupancy and therefore a greater need for service. Okay, fair enough. No, thank you, appreciate that. The, uh, the yeah. second question, and I don't think it's a simple answer. Uh, when you go back to your slide eight, it's really quite noticeable that there's, that the upper tier development charges are a much greater proportion of development charges for our municipality as compared to um, Worth the Lakes or even Kevin Monahan, who is in our, our county. And so I just, I don't, there's probably not an easy explanation for that, but I'll let you try. <laughs> yeah, so it, it would be a number of factors. So one would be that what we're looking at here is the charges that are imposed. Um, not necessarily the maximum charge that could be imposed. So some municipalities will choose to use development charges for all growth related costs or just some of them and they might through policy set charges uh, below what they otherwise could be charging. So there is a, a policy um, implication to this. Um, another factor is the services which are within the, um, the upper tier, lower tier jurisdiction will change by municipality. So some, and that, that would, you know, prime one area we see that for the most part is around water and wastewater services, where when you look at Kortha Lakes, for example, being a single tier municipality, um, water and wastewater is within their authority. And so um, while it wouldn't be for uh, some other municipalities. Uh, and then, and then I guess the, the last, um, uh, sort of area that kind of affects at the both upper tier and, and lower tier level would be just the the intensity of uh, additional growth related capital needs ref, um, with respect to the additional um, development or growth that's occurring in the municipality so depending on the specific circumstances of any given municipality they may have a greater intensity of capital needs for their growth than a, than a, a different municipality has. And so that also affects the, the charges um, by municipality. Great, thank you. I get that probably explains why like Kevin Monaghan, which is growing exponentially, has a, a lower percentage share of county development charges than we do. And we've got, you know, 1.2% increase per year. So that, that, I, that helps me. I, I understand it better, thank you. Well, any other? Sorry, if I may, because this is a public meeting, um, I didn't yeah. have anyone registered for it, but I will turn on the raise a hand feature and any members of the public that wish to speak to the development charge study update can raise their hand. Just yes, sir. Waiting for anyone from the public to want to speak. I just want to remind that we were at a development charge meeting at County Council and their background study suggested that a $2,500 increase in the county, at the county level for the same development charges. There's been some other things included. So, I mean, that's just a suggested increase. The county can do whatever they'd like, but it just all adds on to our development charge. Mm -hmm. I'm not okay. seeing any hands raised from members of the public. So if you want, you can move on to reconvening the regular meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Neil. So uh, 
get a, a motion to reconvene the meeting. Okay. And Carol, can we maybe add receiving that for information? We'll Pardon? Okay, we'll do we do that after. Okay, so then I will second that motion. Oh. Okay, in favor? Okay, Carrie. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We're now at the business arising from the statutory public meeting. Um, and unless Adele disagrees, I believe the recommendation is to receive the report and direct staff to bring forward an amending bylaw for consideration at the April 5th meeting. That's correct. Peter? Motion, okay. And Carol, okay. All in favor? Carrie, thank you. Okay, what should we do we now? Yeah. Now we'll should be going we suspend into the motion. Huh? Yep, we'll be yeah. going into the statutory public. Okay, yeah, yeah. So we'll suspend the motion to suspend the. Okay, motion to Carol, suspend. Yes. Okay. Carry. Okay. All in favor? Carry. Thank you. Okay, yes, I introduce the file. Through you, Deputy Mayor, this is a public meeting under Section 34 of the Planning Act to consider an amendment to the Municipality's Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw, B 2014-070. A notice of public meeting for today's application containing the prescribed information was circulated to all landowners within a 120 meter radius of the subject lands at least 20 days prior to this meeting. The notice was also mailed to all prescribed agencies, public bodies, and persons in accordance with regulations. Anyone wanting to be notified of any decision from today's public meeting must send in a written request to either myself or the clerk, and the notice of passing will be mailed to them, setting out the method and manner in which appeals may be made to the Ontario Land Tribunal. Please note that if a person does not send a written comment prior to the passing of the bylaw, or make an oral submission at a public meeting, that person may not be entitled to appeal the decision. Thank you. Um, so preamble for file number 21-16. This is a public meeting for file number 21-16 to consider zoning bylaw amendment submitted by the owner 1447147 1, Ontario Incorporated of 770 Lakehurst Road. The subject property is zoned Community Facility 1 zone and is currently occupied by a former church, which hasn't been utilized for a number of years. The applicant wishes to rezone the lands to a rural residential 24 zone to allow for the existing church to be renovated and utilized as a dwelling unit in addition to adding an attached garage to the existing building. The exception is required to provide relief from existing setbacks. The subject lands are approximate to a wetland feature, which has been evaluated through an environmental impact study. The EIS concluded that the rezoning and construction would have no significant impact on the key hydrologic feature identified 20 meters or 65.6 feet from the edge of the existing church. There is a planning report on the agenda from the municipality's planning consultant, Chris Jones. He notes that the applicant has recently installed a new class four septic system and that the proposed reuse of the dormant church has planning merit. Chris's report indicates that the application is generally consistent with both the provincial policy statement and the growth plan. The municipality has received commentary from Peterborough Public Health in support of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment and no further comments have been received. Further, if any members of the public did not register with the clerk indicating their intent to make an oral submission, but would like to do so at this time, please use the raise a hand feature so we are able to prompt you in order for you to make an oral submission. Thank you. Okay. Any members have come? Members of the public, no. Okay. Any comments from the council? Yes, sir. This, to me, this just seems like a, a very reasonable request for a zoning bylaw amendment. That 
the EIS didn't identify anything significant that would be damaged by it, so I certainly would support this one. Okay. Seconder. Did you make that motion? Comment. That was just a comment. Pardon? That was just a comment. We'll visit that later on the agenda. Oh, okay. okay you know, so. Next one is there. Through you, Deputy Mayor, this is a public meeting for file number 21 24 to consider a zoning bylaw amendment submitted by property owners Danny and Jackie Chiesa for the property located at 21 Fire Route 77 on Pigeon Lake. The subject lands have a shoreline frontage of approximately 30 meters or 100 feet and a lot area of approximately 1,021 square meters or 10,991 square feet. The property is currently zoned shoreline residential private access. The lot is currently occupied by a 109.9 square meter or 1,183 square foot dwelling a 39.9 square meter or 429.5 square foot accessory cabin that currently contains cooking and sanitary facilities and a 22.3 square meter or 240 square foot shed. The total lot coverage for the existing structures, including the decks, equates to 23%. The applicant wishes to demolish all existing structures in order to construct a 164.8 square meter or 1,775 square foot replacement dwelling and a 29.7 square meter or 320 square foot garage. The total lot coverage of the proposed structures, including the decks, equates to 26%. In order to construct the proposed structures, uh, the applicants would require the following relief from the zoning bylaw. One, a reduction to the westerly interior side yard setback from 4.5 meters to 2.3 meters. Two, a reduction to the easterly interior side yard setback from 4.5 meters to 2.2 meters. Three, a reduction to the 30 meter minimum water yard setback to 10.5 meters to the proposed dwelling, which is a slight improvement over the existing water yard setback to the existing dwelling of 9.9 meters. Four, a reduction to the 30 meter minimum water yard setback to 7.7 .7 meters to the proposed attached deck which will result in no improvement over the existing water yard setback to the existing attached deck. Five, a reduction to the 12 meter front yard setback to 8.6 meters to allow the replacement of an existing second dwelling to a detached garage. Six, an increase to the allowable total lot coverage from 20% to 26%, 26.1%, excuse me. Uh, there is a planning report on the agenda from the municipality's planning consultant, Chris Jones. Chris's report states that the application is generally not consistent with the growth plan. Mr. Jones details that the intent of the growth plan for any proposed defined a uh, proposal defined as infill development must undergo a site evaluation to determine if any restoration of the applicant's lands would be workable or feasible. Additionally, Mr. Jones notes his concern with further non-compliance in terms of the lot coverage on a lot which is dependent on a class 5 holding tank and the creation of a new side yard encroachment. Neil Campbell and the property owner Jackie Chiesa are both on the line to answer any questions should council or the public have any. Any members of the public did not register with the clerk indicating their intent to make an oral submission but would like to do so at this time, please use the raise a hand feature so we are able to promote you in order for you to make an oral submission. Thank you. Any uh, comments? Council? Yes, Terry? Yeah, on page four of the planning justification report, it says that the existing is 17% lock up coverage. We allow 20, and it says that the proposed is only 19.1% lock coverage. That does differ considerably from the other planning report. Yeah, I've seen that. 
I'm just wondering which one is the more correct number. Sarah? Uh, if I may, uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, uh, the numbers I'm utilizing are directly from the site plan and survey provided to me. That's your question, I think, yeah, I, I, It's quite a bit different, that's all I was looking at. We do have um, members of the public, the applicant and the owners that have um, registered to speak. So we have Neil Campbell and Jackie Chiesa. I think Neil had a presentation. So Neil, if you're ready, I'm gonna make you a presenter now. <laughs> Hi, is Neil, this is Jackie and Danny Chiesa. Is Neil on the line? He is, I've made him a presenter and he's just unmuted now. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Neil Campbell. Um, so I'm a principal at a local architecture firm here in Peterborough, uh, also a resident of Trent Lakes. Uh, so I'm representing the applicant. Uh, with regards to the zoning bylaw application, just to clear that up, the uh, stats that were um, provided in the notice are correct. Um, so we're best to go with those. Uh, I, I want to respond Firstly, to Chris Jones' um, comments, uh, we, when we were initially engaged with uh, the owners of the property, uh, we evaluated their cottage. They've owned it for 40 years now. It's a modest dwelling uh, with two bedrooms in it with a living space. And as mm -hmm. it was mentioned, um, there is a bunkie with two bedrooms as well and living and uh, a living room, washroom, and uh, uh, cooking facilities uh, in that. We evaluated the uh, existing cottage. We looked at the, the foundations. Um, we've done a lot of cottage renovations and it was our assessment that uh, the foundations really weren't uh, sufficient to support a new structure. It, it, it just didn't make sense. So that was evaluated. Um, and some time and effort was put into that. Uh, with regards to his second comment regarding a septic, um, a septic permit was applied for and issued in uh, May of 2021. So we, this project has been going back and forth um, with planning for two years now. Um, we've had discussions with Tiffany Lee, Adele Arbor, Allison Martin, Chris Jones, and Barbara Waldron most recently and we have submitted uh, an approved septic permit an archaeological assessment a current digital survey letters from both adjacent neighbors supporting the proposed cottage design and in discussions with planning over the years what we have done is we've rotated the cottage to take advantage of the narrowing profile of the lot and reduce the side yard setbacks We've also looked at um, eliminating any bias to the side yard setbacks, so they're more or less equal on either side. We initially removed the plumbing from the bunkie, um, and most recently we've agreed to um, tear down the bunkie entirely. We've removed the garage entirely and agreed to rebuild that, and we've reduced the floor area of the initial proposed cottage. Um, so we've made a, a number of accommodations as things progressed. And in our most recent uh, meeting, uh, it was our understanding that given these concessions and given the drawings that were presented at that time, which are consistent with the notice that uh, you've been provided with um, that uh, planning was gonna be supporting this application. Um, I can get into detail around coverage and so forth, but essentially um, we're, we're look, you know, I, or I can answer any questions that you may have with regards to the application. Any questions? Public? Oh, sorry. Kelly. No, that's okay. Definitely. 
I, I guess I, I'm just not entirely clear about the lot coverage again. Sure. So back to Councillor Lambshead's question, what is the current lot coverage and what is the proposed lot coverage? The current lot coverage, uh, the existing buildings and decks comes in at 23%. Now, and I can the, just follow up then that that was one of the concerns that was raised by uh, our planner was that not something that you were able to work with in in redoing some of your drawings or amending your your site plan yes it was and um currently the uh the the proposed design before you has a lot coverage for the buildings themselves of 20% and the additional 6% is the front and rear deck to the cottage. So both decks, both the front and the rear decks are so low to the ground that as per the Ontario building code, they won't require railings or guards. So they're very low profile. And in uh, fact, if I may, uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, um, regardless of how close the deck is to the ground, it is still an above ground structure. So by definition, in our comprehensive zoning bylaw, decks are included under our law coverage. Yes, we understand. Yeah. So that's hopefully that answers um, and clarifies uh, coverage, both current and proposed. Thank you. Any more? I don't have any other members of the public wishing to speak. I don't know if the owner Jackie would like to provide any comments or we're just there to answer any questions. Um, I'm just available to answer questions. Yes. Is our planner, sorry, you deputy planner, yeah. is our planner available to talk to uh, to talk to this application and uh, this report. Through you, Deputy Mayor Windover. Um, Chris Jones is not available this afternoon. I'm um, with Sarah here in the office and we'd be happy to answer any questions. In my review of the application and looking at Chris Jones' planning report, um, the proposed dwelling is going to two stories and the proposed gross floor area is up in the neighborhood of 3,000 square feet. And Mr. Jones in his report talks about the property is very small, is constrained, and has a number of non-compliances. Um, and also with the class five septic system, the holding tank being proposed. So. Um, they are proposing a further encroachment to one of the side yards and lot coverage is going up another 3.1%. So those were some of the highlights from his report and both Sarah and I are here. We're happy to answer any further questions that council may have. Through you, Deputy Mayor, if I can just respond to those comments. So. Uh, the zoning does allow for a two-story building. Um, we are maximum height. We are 2.5 meters less than the maximum height allowable. Um, if the decks are an issue, you know, certainly we could back out the front deck, eliminate that, and that uh, takes off 5% of coverage. So we could go from the the ask of 26% and relax it down to 21%. That's certainly on the table and has been all the way along as we've met with planners. Um, with regards to the, the setbacks, um, the existing setback along the eastern edge uh, from the building is the same as um, what's existing and with the deck, with regards to the deck, we're actually improving on the setback. It's only on the western edge where we take an existing setback of 3.9 and reduce it down to 2.3. And that was again talking about splitting the difference. Um, 
And as I'd mentioned, the lot does narrow, so that was a challenge. Um, I did submit a document to uh, the clerk that illustrates um, adjacent properties uh, and their conditions. And as a sort of a brief, a very brief overview, um, that is on file with you. Uh, and, you know, lot 29, which is two doors over, has a side yard setback of less than four feet. Lot 33 has a side yard setback of four feet. Lot um, 19 has a side yard setback of five foot three. I say these are plus or minus sort of half a foot. We were out there with tape measures. Um, and, and as I had mentioned, all the, you know, that we submitted letters from both adjacent neighbors. Um, Jackie and Dan have talked to the neighbors along this stretch of road. Uh, along Fire Route 77, there are only 18 cottages. A number of them have been rebuilt. Meant, uh, and a good number of them are well over 20% in terms of lot coverage. That's through you, Deputy Mayor Window. I just calculated what the coverage would be if the front deck was removed. It would be 24%, not 21%. Yes, Terry? From my perspective in, of the plan, I mean, the, the reducing some side yard setbacks not ever my concern that much it's the front yard the water yard setback that always concerns me i want to make sure that we protect that front yard and protect the water and protect the water's edge because erosion and things is very important to, to preserving our lakes and our water so i think you're actually increasing the setback from the water yard just yes we, yes we are through de you, you deputy mayor yes we are yes And that was always on the table in terms of, you know, you have to understand the more we push the building back, the the less, the, the, the more of a reduction of side yard setback we've been asking for. So where we struck uh, a middle ground was, let's take the existing from the east and respect that, balance it off to the west, and then retain or improve on the front yard or water yard setback. So we managed to achieve that with the, the building um, that we're proposing. There are also been drawings that we submitted for the entire building, uh, floor plans and elevations. Um, it is modest in scale. It is traditional in character. It is entirely keeping with this type of um, development. In fact, it, as I'd mentioned, it was very well received by the neighbors. Do you have a comment or could just just could we possibly yes. have a look at the the front elevation on page nine or page four of of the municipal planning services just so everyone gets a little idea of what it would possibly look like sure So that's the front elevation. Um, so that's the water side elevation. Thank you very much. That's a little. And if we were to carry, I, I'm not sure whether there are other elevations that are um, included in what planning is put together, but they were certainly submitted. Bianca, attached to the agenda, there was the file name drawings, perhaps that's what Neil's referring to. Yes. Yeah. Good. So if we go to the next page. 
floor plan, modest, very symmetrical, very traditional looking. None of these spaces are overly large. Um, uh, if we could move to the next slide, that's the second floor. And if we could keep going to the elevations, that will provide the counselors with a better idea of the character of it. So that is the water side elevation. The next page, I believe, is the roadside elevation. Yes, that's the roadside elevation. So you can see, hopefully you feel it's a handsome building. Um, and if we care to move it to one more slide, this shows us the side side elevation is fairly simple. Um, <coughs> We do not have a topographical survey. The intention is to hug the ground. The, you know, so we are showing a slope down to the water, but the idea is to keep this as, as low in profile as possible. Um, that's it. That was early on. It was expressed uh, by the clients. That was their intention. Um, and um, so. Oh, sorry, Carol. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, first of all, I appreciate the modifications that you've made to try and make the best use of this lot. Um, like uh, Councillor Lamb said, I'm not terribly concerned about the interior yard setback going from 3.9 to 2.3 meters. My concern is really around the lot coverage. 26% um, is quite a bit over the um, requirement of 20, and it's expanding what is already there. So I don't know if there's any possible way that the lot coverage could be cut back and will allow for uh, the building of, you know, very nice building of the type that you, you've drawn. Uh, if I may, uh, Councillor Armstrong, through you, Deputy Mayor Windover, um, through my calculations earlier on today, uh, if the garage, proposed garage was taken out, the house and the deck would meet the 20% lot coverage. You, May I, um, it's Jackie Chiesa, if I could address council. Um, so when we um, proposed the cottage, we, as we said, we had a cabin with a uh, kitchen, bathroom, two bedrooms and a living room. And um, that square footage is without the deck on the cabin was 430 square feet. Um, when we, what we did was basically take that square footage and add that instead to the main cottage that we were proposing to build. Um, so 592 square feet got added to the main cottage and we took away the 430. So really the actual dwellings itself are only 162 square feet more once we take, remove the cabin with the plumbing facilities or 1.8% more. Um, that being said, um, I think the decks and, and as Neil proposed, the front deck is 231 square feet. So we'd be willing to just take that away. It is very flush to the ground, as you see here, which would, as um, it was pointed out, that would take it down to about 24% lot coverage, which is 1% bigger than we currently are. Um, the garage is, we have an existing garage now. Um, and we proposed it to be about 70 square feet larger, but we could take that garage down to 250 square feet, which would actually make the lot coverage exactly the same as it is now at 23.3%. Uh, if I may, Council Members, through you, Deputy Mayor Windover, um, if I'm given the opportunity to share my screen, I can show what the building um, being referred to as a garage is. Um, it's it's not a garage. It's classified under our system as a shed. Um, let's just see if anything. Um, So this is the structure here. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes, this is the structure being referred to as a garage, which is actually a shed. 
e either way, they're both classified as accessory buildings with the same zoning requirements against them. Um, I, I, th I think, I, I'm hoping that uh, you, you've been able to see the, the spirit of cooperation that my client has, you know, um, tabled at every step of the way, including today, meaning, you know, we're, we're, this is a dream for them. It's a family cottage of 40 years. It, it's looking a little tired. It's very cold in the shoulder seasons. It's got low ceilings. It, they'd like to have a four season um, a cottage for their retirement. And it, they've made concessions all the way along, um, taking out the bunky building, the washroom out of the bunky building, adjust, rotating the building, adjusting the size of it. And still today, we're still looking at, you know, I, I, Jackie's put it on the table, um, you know, 23.5% or 23.3%, which is essentially what the coverage is today. We can work with that. So sorry. Thank you, through, through Deputy Mayor. Uh, I I know I can't make a motion in the public meeting, but I I think I'm going to suggest that we send this back one more time, and I apologize for that, um, so that those uh, suggestions by the owner can be worked through with our planning staff, and then bring that zoning bylaw amendment back to the next or soon meeting, so then we can proceed with it. But I think for us to try and hammer out those details at the council meeting is probably not the best use of everybody's time, and um, it's not my expertise, and I know I can't make a motion, I'm just making a suggestion. <laughs> yes, Jess? Um, I have Barb on the line, and she would like to make a comment. Hi, Barb. Through you, hi, through you, Deputy Mayor Windver. I just wanted to make one comment about the word cottage. Um, I know that that's how the owners uh, intend to use this building. It's their cottage because they have a, a home in, um, I'm not sure where they live, but they have a separate home. Um, in terms of building code, uh, to us, this is not a cottage. So I just want council to be aware that this is going to be built as a four season home. This is going to be built as a year round home. It may be a cottage to the current owners but down the road it is most likely going to become a year-round home so that is just another component that you need to take into account that um, I just want to make that clarification and it's Jackie Chiesa once again uh, for council just so you're aware we we reside in that home or that cottage as I call it I guess I call it, we call it that because my father acquired in the early 80s and we always call it a cottage, but we are there all year round right now. We are there all year round. Thank you. What is, yeah, you know, maybe, are you uh, I'm good. proposing to make a motion? Of that? I would make a motion to move out of the public meeting and back into a regular meeting. Okay. All in favor? Okay. Passed. Okay, right then. Okay. Yeah. So business arising of it. Business arising at a statutory public meeting, Sarah. How many business any? Thank you, through you, Deputy Mayor. There was a public meeting held for file number 21-16. At this time, staff are recommending that council receive the report from the planning consultant, Chris Jones, and support the zoning bylaw amendment being requested. The zoning bylaw amendment is on today's agenda under bylaws for appeal. Yes, sir. I'll make a motion to support that. Okay. Terry, yes, okay. Second. All in favor? Okay, second, Gary. Okay, now, how about the number four, 2124? Thank you, through you, Deputy Mayor. There is a public meeting held for file number 21-24. At this time, staff are recommending that council not approve the requested zoning bylaw amendment. Any motion here? Uh, 
a comment well, is? I just have a comment. I'm just yes. If you're ever going to be able to develop this lot, do something more permanent like they're suggesting. This is about the only possible way you could ever do it. They're trying to keep the as small as it can. They're staying away from the water. I know they're going to increase or want to increase the size of the dwelling by three or 0.3 of a percent, but I would certainly support removing the front deck, staying near the lot lines and reduce the garage slash shed by that little bit that keeps it in that 23.3%. I think if you're ever going to allow people to develop their lot that they've had for 40 or 50 years, this is about the only possible way you can do it. And I think they've made some concessions and, and many to be looking. I mean, they sure they their their vision is fairly grandiose, but on that piece of property, that's all you could do and make it reasonable. So I do think they're asking for a reasonable relief in our zoning bylaw. I'll have to agree with that, I think, Terry. Yeah. I'll second the motion. So yeah, so I guess further to that, I guess I will make that a motion that we ask them to enter into a site plan agreement. So we do have some controls over shorelines and things and, and approve that a motion as recommended by Chris Jones second second paragraph there that we need we enter into a site plan agreement. So that we can make sure that the shoreline during this construction is protected and preserved. Yeah. Okay, I'll uh, sorry. Yeah. Karen knows what's going. <laughs> I will just clarify that the resolution would be, or the recommend, the motion is to support the zoning bylaw amendment, defer approval pending the um, and applicant entering into a site plan agreement, and that staff be directed to prepare a zoning bylaw amendment with the removal of the front deck and a reduction in the size of the garage to maintain the 23.3% lot coverage. Perfect. Thank you. Are you seconding that? Yes, I am. Yeah, okay, Peter. Okay, I, I think you're right there. Okay, all in favor? Okay, carries favor. Yep. Yeah. Okay, carried. Okay, so any presentations now? None? Your delegation now, okay, with the, we will get involved, I guess, with the Lions Club now. So who else there? I guess uh, Jim, would Jim be shot right? Would Jimmy be here? You're still muted, Jim. How about now? Yeah, good now, Jim. Okay, great. Good afternoon. This, I think, is going to be way less complicated than what you've just been going through for the last hour plus. Wow. Uh, so my name is Jim Shipley. I'm here representing the newly formed Buckhorn District Lions Club. Um, so. Let me start by, by saying one in eight Canadians are experiencing food insecurity. Uh, studies have shown that families with work income are increasingly accessing food banks and that there's been a 25% increase in food bank usage uh, since 2019 with 41% of those clients being youth and children. Those are important things for us to remember as we go through this. Um, I wanted to give you just a really quick uh, background on how we came to this point. Um, the Buckhorn District Lions Club um, formed in the middle of a pandemic, kind of unheard of. Um, and we actually have around 60 members now. So these are energetic uh, volunteers, all ages, um, all walks of life, um, and they all share a common goal, and that's basically altruism. Um, when we first got together, we had to develop kind of where, where we wanted the club to go, what we wanted our service projects to be. And we had three, um, and one of them was to address hunger issues. So 
we did a few things before Christmas. We facilitated a donation that goes to two needy families that were identified by the principal of the school. Um, and these needy families get a gift card every month um, for essentials. Um, we had, of course, the food drive at the Santa Parade. We were involved with the food hampers and with the, uh, the meal program, things like that. And at that, in the fall, an idea came up for this food cupboard. Um, as soon as the idea was, was broached, we kind of discussed it at executive, took it to the membership, and there was, there was a consensus that this was a good thing to explore. Um, we realized that there was the Trent Lakes Outreach Center, um, and I reached out to them in the fall um, to try and propose a collaboration, um, and that um, they weren't interested in that. So we went forward kind of on our own. Uh, let me give you some figures that I've kind of gathered uh, more recently um, that I think kind of are really telling things. So North Kawartha, population 2,500 people, and these are consensus, these are census figures, so these don't represent seasonal residents. So it's apples to apples. Um, they offer a twice weekly food bank and they serve 195 clients. Lakefield has a once weekly food bank. They serve 490 clients. Bridge North has a once weekly food bank that serves 164 clients. Trent Lakes, with the last census population about 5,600, has a once monthly food bank that serves 25 clients. This is the smallest and least frequent food bank of all the 36 food banks that Core the Food Chair looks after. We, uh, we've been working, of course, with the school. Um, the school has a very active uh, food program. Um, nobody can say for sure what that means, but it could indicate that there is a level of food security at the school. Only way to find that out is to do a pilot project to find out. Um, but it is a, a very active program. And we have a letter of support from the principal of the school um, stating that she believes that addressing food insecurity um, would help some of the students and their families. Um, we've canvassed other kind of involved community members, such as the pharmacist and community care. Um, and we have letters of support for them because they believe they are seeing ongoing food insecurity in Trent Lakes. And we've had a lot to do with Kawartha Food Share. Um, Kawartha Food Share is willing to accept an application for a food cupboard to become another aid that they supply. And uh, the CEO or the uh, director of Kawartha Food Share has also written a letter of support. I can read those letters to you. They came in after the date for submissions, um, or I can provide them for you later if you want. It's uh, as you wish. So essentially, we believe that, that this information says that there might be a, an ongoing issue of food insecurity in Trent Lakes. Um, it, Trent Lakes is such an outlier in this if you go further, it even gets more, more complicated. Um, but there could easily be that Trent Lakes is not addressing the food insecurity um, issue adequately. The only way to know this is, I think, with a project to find out. Um, and the Bridge North, I mean, the uh, Buckhorn District Lions Club has offered to do this no cost, no risk pilot project really to find out the answer. We know that there have been some issues raised in the community, um, and I want to address a few of those. Um, in speaking with the CEO of the library and with somebody from the library uh, board, we understand that while they don't necessarily disagree that um, finding out whether there is a food insecurity problem here is a bad idea. Um, they disagree with the location that's been proposed, which as everyone knows is the uh, OPP 
station that's under the library. And they had a few uh, issues that they thought were significant, um, and I've spoken with them about it. So one, of course, is vermin. Every food bank everywhere, including the Trent Lakes Outreach Center, has to address the issue of vermin. Um, there's a whole protocol for how to do that. Uh, there are very well-established procedures. Um, and of course, uh, we would do the same. As a further um, kind of uh, concession uh, to the library board, we could easily turn this food cupboard, if it was in the former OPP station, into a place that really has no issues uh, with vermin control, in that we would uh, have shelving units there, but we would only store foods that do not attract vermin there, such as canned goods, personal care products, cleaning products, things like that. We would assemble hampers off-site, and this is actually pretty easy to do. Kawartha Food Share has exhaustive lists about how to assemble a one-person food hamper, you know, a family food hamper, things like that. Um, we would assemble them off-site, bring them to the site on the days that the cupboard was open, and not store anything that could attract vermin. And as I said to the librarian, I'm, uh, I can assure her that we would meet with them as often as they wanted, weekly if they wanted initially, um, to address, the, make sure this issue does not ever raise its head. Um, the next issue was parking. It's a small parking lot, we realize that. Um, I believe that if the volunteers from the cupboard and the volunteers from the goodbye room parked off site, not a hard thing to do in downtown Buckhorn, um, then that would leave the parking lot. And we envisioned a traffic flow of probably one or two vehicles per hour um, and on site for only five or 10 minutes. Um, because we will follow you know, all the protocols that you have to to be a member of Court of Future, including privacy, confidentiality, COVID-19, um, safety plans. Uh, it will initially be a drive up, get your hamper, drive away. So not a lot of time in the parking lot. And we don't think that that will really be a significant issue. Um, another issue that was raised was confidentiality um, in that people might feel uncomfortable coming to such a public place being seen accessing a food bank. Unfortunately, every food bank has to make a trade-off between accessibility and uh, confidentiality. And almost every food bank chooses accessibility over confidentiality, um, over embarrassment. I mean, the, the one in Lakefield is right downtown. Most of them are right downtown where people can access them. So not an issue that that you can do away with. Uh, let's see, what were the other issues? And then of course, if, if, uh, if this does go forward, we're happy to keep in constant dialogue with the library to address any issues that, that come up that, uh, that might affect them. Um, the next uh, kind of concern is with the Trent Lakes Outreach Center. Um, and as you've all heard, the Trent Lakes Outreach Center feels that the food cover um, would negatively impact them. Uh, I've spoken with them and emailed with them quite a lot since the fall. Um, and I, I try to reassure them that this is not to replace them, um, that this would be really a supplementation. And really, this is an issue I think that we need to get an answer to. And I think this is the way to get the answer. Um, we're happy to refer people to the Trent Lakes Outreach Center um, if they if they uh, so wish, and we're happy to distribute their emergency number if they so wish. Um, we've already spoken about that we would not offer the cupboard in the dates around when the um, food bank operates. Um, and of course, we'd follow the same protocols that they do. Um, I did want to address the, the whole 24 7, 365 um, emergency um, service that's offered by Train Lakes. Yes. Yeah. We're going to have to get this finished off, Jim. You're getting quite a long time. Okay, great. Anyways, so I'm almost done. 
So I don't, I'm not an expert on this subject. I just speak to somebody who is much more knowledgeable than me, and they believe that this, that the 24-hour service thing is not really a substitute for a stable ongoing supply. That the issues are that it only really looks after the 25 clients of the outreach center, not probably the large number of people who are not current clients, um, and that it doesn't really work as a substitute. So if we do go forward, uh, the vision is, is this will be a low barrier, or in some cases, zero barrier, stable, frequent, um, and flexible source of uh, healthy food for the people in Trent Lakes who need it, whether they need it in a hard week, for a month, or indefinitely. Thanks, Jim. Uh, any comments? I have, I have one. Yes. Um, just uh, when you were stating about the food bank servicing uh, Trent Lakes, there's at least two or three other food banks that service Trent Lakes. And the, the one in, uh, in Kenmount? Kenmount is not serviced, Kenmount is serviced not by Kawartha Food Chair. It's actually serviced by Lindsay. No, no, but I'm saying uh, people that live in Trent Lakes use that service. True, and but it's not a Trent Lakes food bank. No, but it's a, you would never be servicing the people that live uh, in Kenmount or around Kenmount by uh, a food bank in Mudhorn. Agreed. And, and it's very similar to the food bank in uh, Bob Cajun services the people that uh, live in the Nogi Creek, Nogi Creek area. The only comment I have. Any other question? Any Terry? Just, just a follow up to, to Councillor Franzen's comment there is, when you say there's only 25 people in Trent Lakes receiving food from a food bank, I think that's very skewed because there are more food banks and more people in Trent Lakes receiving food bank material. So I, I think that's just a little skewed because we only took the numbers from that one food bank. So so if <laughs> so what you're saying people in Trent Lakes have to go outside of Trent Lake to access a food bank. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I believe the point I was trying to make is that not everybody in Trent Lakes would ever use the food bank that would be in Buckhorn. Even if they had food insecurity, they, they would have to get it elsewhere because it would be an hour drive one way. I guess the only way you would know if people needed or could access this was if you did a pilot project. And I think the fact that, that the numbers are so crazy out of line um, I think it obligates you to do something, whether with the Buckhorn District Lions Club or in some other way. Jim, have you? Used, I, I do suppose you have gave you a thought of trying to find someplace else, of course. But uh, have you? Did you investigate, like let's say, the hall and the, the old school in Deer Bay? Um, I didn't personally. Um, the president of the of the Lions Club investigated several different possible sites, um, and it starts to become the same problem of accessibility. The reason this site would be fairly ideal is because it's close to the pharmacy, the medical center, the drugstore, um, sorry, the grocery store. So people coming home from work could access it on a regular basis um, when they need it. So it, it is it is really a much more ideal site. Oh, I do agree it's an ideal site, but it's just there's a lot of people not in favor of it that, as far as that's really? cool. that's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. it, it'd be a great it'd be a great uh, thing to put into place, I'll tell you, to see if it worked, that's for darn, but it's just I just don't think the area the place is gonna work out. Thanks. Anyone else comment? No, sorry, Chair. Uh, I was just going to make a motion to receive the delegation. Make a motion to receive it. And you, you got a second that? 
Yep. Peter, okay. All in favor? Okie dokie. Good. Approved. Okay. Carried. Okay. Thanks, uh, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I guess we have Peter Raymond then. Is he Peter? Present? Just looking at this. Good afternoon, council, uh, staff, and members of the public. Um, next slide, thank you. So I'm uh, providing comments uh, as per your request. Next slide, thank you. I do have to make a correction to some statements that were incorrectly made by the mayor at the February 1st council meeting. And what was indicated that information would be shared with our team. And I indicated that we did not see a need to change at the present time. We would continue as business as usual. Uh, the food bank it already offers emergency calls and we are a registered and recognized food bank. Also given the fact that there was no formal plan or details about the proposed program was shared and it appeared it was predicated on the use of the OPP office, which seemed very unlikely. Next slide, thank you. I did send a letter to council and to staff on January 30th for the uh, February 1st council meeting. Unfortunately, it wasn't on the uh, correspondence, so I'm sharing that with you. Um, there was a, quite a bit of concern from our volunteers and our donors uh, in regards to some inaccurate information and misinformation uh, that was being communicated. And it seems there's potential for irreparable harm, confusion and conflict as well as duplication of service across the municipality involving clients, donors, volunteers, supporters, and weakening of the existing support system place. Food security is a concern to all communities. As a result, consistent food supplies already provided through registered food banks operating not only in the municipality of Trent Lakes, as well as Peterborough County, right across Ontario for many years. While most local options, well, the most option for Trent Lakes is a physical uh, food bank that operates once a month, is accessible 24-7, 365, and we are offered to uh, get food to our clients within 24 to 48 hours. So there is a food supply service available every day of the week if needed. Next slide, thank you. It would appear that the proposal for the, the Buckhorn District Lions Club may be founded on good intentions but lack in, in accurate information as well as data regarding the community needs. Those in need use community contacts, social services, agencies, religious organizations, and trusted individuals to assess local food supply without any publicity regarding the process in order to protect their privacy and dignity. More fortunate community members are often unaware of the specifics of these programs as a result of this, and may not think that such services exist. Next slide, thank you. There are a number of issues with the location, the OPP. I just listed a few here, and I believe that the OPP and the library board on the delegation this afternoon will cover that as well. So next slide, thank you. Another concern here is that uh, seems to be a breach of conflict of interest on the part of the mayor, who is both the president of the Bisbuckon District Lions Club and the mayor. Use of the mayoral position of authority and influence is both unbecoming and democratic. The Municipal Act includes words to avoid such behavior. Uh, participation in the Police Service Board and the Municipal Council 
requires that she removes herself from the discussion and decision making regarding this matter. And unfortunately, she has not done so. With the exception of today, she is not present. While I have great respect for the Lions organization and the work that they do, it would seem that this venture is not founded on facts or data to support it. I would suggest that there are other areas in need in the municipality which would better serve and well-intentioned energetic volunteers of the local client club. Respectfully submitted. Okay, if you could uh, slide uh, two slides forward, please. Thank you. So just a sample of some of the food supply programs available in Trent Lakes. As mentioned, at the public school, there's a breakfast and lunch program, which uh, caters to all the children there, that's free. At the Buckon Community Centre, there's a meal takeout, and they're nominally charged, clients pay. At community care, there's Meals on Wheels, and the volunteers there deliver and shop for the clients, and the clients pay for the food. Prior to the pandemic, there was the Diner Club, and that was held at the local community halls across the township. We have the food bank once a month. In Kinmount, I uh, do correct me, uh, that it's actually twice a month there. And Bob Cajun, uh, they've also indicated that any clients that are close to Bob Cajun from Trent Lakes will be the be exceptions. We also, some of us also are involved with the Christmas Hamper Fund, which is an annual event. And uh, I'll show some more statistics on that. So overall, it can be said that already exists a broad range of food supply related programs in Trent Lakes that covers children, families, and seniors meeting the needs of the community. Next slide, thank you. Some metrics. Trent Lakes has the honor of being the oldest population, not only in Peterborough County, but in the province of Ontario. And that was as the census of 2016. And we continue that trend as we've increased our population and a significant portion of more fortunate retirees from the GTA area. Some other metrics at the bottom of the screen here showing that Community Care has over 300 clients. The Buckhorn School has 160 plus youth. At our food bank here, ranges in roughly 25 people. And that does fluctuate month by month. I wasn't able to get uh, numbers from the food bank in Kim out, but they deal with both Trent Lakes, Minden Hills, and City of Quarter Lakes. And at the Christmas hamper, this past Christmas, there's 24 families. And from social services, we have roughly 30 to 35 people on the Ontario Works Program. Next slide, thank you. The Christmas hamper fund has been gradually trending on a downward trend. We were anticipating this past Christmas a lot more people, but it's actually been the lowest that we received. Next slide, thank you. Just give an overview of the food bank. We've been operating 20 years. I've been involved with it since about 2015. Um, we've got dedicated, passionate volunteers. We have the phone number available, our website. And whilst we're only open one day a month, we provide food for at least three weeks. And at Christmas time, we provide uh, food cards and extra things. Prior to the COVID, we also organized the Meet Your Needs in the fall and helped that at the BCC. Next slide, thank you. We do a client survey. And from our recent survey, most of our clients, the majority of them, are satisfied when three to four weeks worth their food survives them. And they're most happy with the food bank held just once a month. Next slide, thank you. 
In terms of emergency calls, they've been relatively low over the last number of years, on average, two to three. Next slide, thank you. We have numerous questions on the proposed food cupboard. Mr. Shipley has answered some of them, but not all. And um, next slide, thank you. So in summary, given that emergency demand is low, the proposed OPP location is problematic, food supply programs already exist, there is no compelling support for the proposed food supply program. The suggestions for consideration will be to refer people to existing food supply programs or conduct a needs assessment through consultation with community agencies and determine the true unaddressed needs which could be better served by the Lions Club. Consider fundraising initiatives to support existing volunteer groups across Trent Lakes. This would minimize overlap, duplication, and existing volunteer groups. Next slide, thank you. These are some of our partners. Next slide, thank you. And you can find us on all these websites and also on the 507 Express in the contact page. And that's our food drive that we've been doing during the pandemic and we'll be continuing after the pandemic. Next slide, thank you. And these are the food banks that are uh, mentioned. And um, so Walter Food Chair handles the Peterborough City and the County of Peterborough. And Kawartha Lakes Food Source covers Kinmount and Bob Cajun and the city of Kawartha Lakes. Next slide, thank you. And that is the end of my presentation. I would make one request as and when council is making a decision to have a recorded vote so we know which way each councillor is voting on this item. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, Peter. Yeah, uh, just a couple comments. Uh, sure. Uh, Peter, you've made a, a great presentation. It's very in-depth. I appreciate that very much. You've made some allegations towards our mayor. Is this where it stops? Or uh, uh, One of the issues I have with conflict of interest, we seem to hold our staff to a higher standard than uh, members of council are held at. If you wish to comment, you can. If not, I, I respect whatever your thoughts are. Yep. Uh, no, no comment, Councillor Francis. Thank you. Okay. I don't want to make this a personal issue or anything. I'm speaking on behalf of our volunteers for our organization. Yep. Yes, sir. Just a comment. I, I don't think anybody's ever said that your organization wasn't excellent and you represent Trent Lakes to the best of your ability every single time. Everyone I've ever commented with says exactly the same thing. You supply a very essential service and you do it very well. So. Thank you very much to all your people for that, Peter. Thank you very much, Councillor. And it's glad to see you here back on, on Council today. <laughs> well, okay, thank you, there. Yes, sir. Receivers. I was going to make a motion to receive. Okay. I'll take a motion. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Yeah, carried. Okay, good. Okay, now we have. Uh, Margaret, then, she here. Yep, she's on the line. You're still she's on the line. Okay, Margaret. thanks.
Margaret, you're still muted. You'll have to unmute yourself. There should be a red button uh, with a microphone and There we go. Is that better? Great. Yeah, thanks. Okay. No camera yet, though. No camera. Okay. I brushed my hair for nothing. <laughs> now it's giving me a chance. Okay. Sorry about that. Right. First, first time with municipal politics. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so you've had my letter. I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to read it to you. I just want to um, state right off the fact that I am a member of Lions Club, a founding member, charter member, as well as being um, head of, uh, chair of the library board for Trent Lake. So I'm kind of experiencing this from both sides of the uh, field, which is which is interesting and unique. Um, so thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor and Council, for the chance to address this. I want to point out that that when this first came up at Lions Club, wearing that hat, I did offer to be a go-between um, because I was worried about um, duplication, dilution of services. I volunteer with community care. I was a former school principal. I'm well aware of some of the programs that exist in this municipality and other ones. Um, and I was concerned that there was going to be some um, duplication, some some uh, hard feelings. Uh, you know, things might get a little tense. Um, I offered when it came up for discussion. I phoned Jim before it came to council. I could feel the, the weather uh, changing a bit with regards to this proposal. And my background is one of, of mediating with communities and members and, and thought maybe I could make a difference there. Um, I did, I did um, get a phone, I, I talked to Jim briefly. He said he'd call me back after the council meeting, which he did, and we had a, a nice discussion. Still um, no, no interest yet until we got this point and I, I think if it does go forward that there is still an opportunity to do this in a way that doesn't dilute the programs that are out there already um, but I'm not convinced and neither is the library board so there now I'm going to put my library board hat on so I appreciate as I said the chance to do this for you um, to to express the concerns of the library board um, they share concerns about comfort and food security and insecurity and housing for residents in the area, there's no question. But they are well aware of all the programs that exist because like many of you, they volunteer in a variety of, of places and for a variety of, of uh, organizations. Um, the food supply program came to our attention at the library board through our CEO, Stephanie McPherson, who had been approached by Alliance Club member. And at that time, the details were pretty sparse, but it was that they were going to use the OPP office gain entry through the goodbye room, the staff of the library would receive the food um, and, uh, you know, um, and, and would help with getting it downstairs and, and things would be just fine. Uh, at that, once it came to council, it was quite different um, and it seems to have changed again since then. There was great concern on the part of the, the librarian, librarians, which they wanted me to um, include in this response. Um, so number one, of course, is the presence of food. Anytime you have food in a building where there are books, you are likely to get vermin, as Jim said, transferring from one to the other. And even if you don't have food in consumable containers, like boxes, um, mice will get in, rats will get in, and frankly, they eat soap. So, you know, th they will be there. That is, there is no question about that. Um, parking is definitely going to be a problem. Goodbye Room is, is proposing to open in two weeks from now, if I have my dates correct. And as you probably are aware, that's a very tiny parking spot. Jim, of course, has seen our letter and has answered some of these things from their vantage point. Um, but our volunteers won't be parking off site. Our volunteers have mobility issues themselves, so they will be there. Um, and the other issue, as far as the goodbye room goes, is that there's a conflict with the timing of the goodbye rooms opening open hours and the proposed uh, food program open hours as well. So, you know, there's a conflict of how many cars and how many people would be there uh, at any time. I don't know if you've tried to drop things off, but you have to pick your times very carefully when you're trying to donate to the goodbye room even. Um, and as I said before, the, the library staff will not be involved in, in helping with the food program, it's just not part of their job description, it's not part of their comfort 
um, with regards to the, the busy work they have already upstairs. And the infrastructure that comes along with the library won't be available either. So there won't be any internet or phone, uh, those kinds of things won't be there. Uh, what you'll notice is the, the problem that the OPP is expressing about being moved to um, a different location. They need uh, infrastructure that's in place in that shared municipal building, which is not available at the new site that um, the Lions Club president um, or mayor has suggested. Um, and, and the last point that the council and, and patrons of the library wanted to be make, make sure, or the board and the patrons of the library wanted me to make sure to say was that the OPP's presence in downtown Buckhorn is really valued. They love having it accessible, visible. They see it as a deterrent to crime um, and it's there when, when citizens need it. So having that right smack in the middle of town is a really, um, a really big selling point, frankly, for uh, the OPP's physical location. So we value the work that, that the Trent Lakes Outreach Centre volunteers do um, to meet local needs. We don't think that there are needs being unrecognized or unmet. As you've heard, people in this municipality go to a food bank that is closest to them, whether it's in Bob Cajun, where you may go to do some of your shopping or use the dump on days when ours is closed, whether it's in Kinmount because you live closer up that way or you're heading that way anyway, um, or where you closer to where you work, there are a lot of options already in town. And I think that if we um, have this service, this additional food service, we're going to see dilution of some of the projects that are already in place. Rather than strengthening the food security, it's going to dilute the efforts of the volunteers and some of these programs will collapse because there won't be enough people for them. For community care, for instance, the numbers of clients and the number of meals that are given out are important in terms of their funding. Um, so it, 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 we could have an adverse effect if this program goes forward. So um, I'm confident that the Trent, Trent Lakes Outreach Center, or we're confident that the Trent Lakes Outreach Center is capable of adjusting to the needs of its clients. I think that the, um, the community knows that it's there. As long as they are um, always adjusting what they're saying and who their um, channels of communication are, it's a very responsive organization. I think the Lions Club would be well served to look at the data and talk to community partners. I know there are kind of think tanks going on right now about what the needs are and put their heads together to solve or mitigate the impact of other um, problems that might be happening out in the community. Um, and I, as a sidebar, I'm also vice president of the community center, because I can't say no. And um, we started discussing how we can support the Trent Lakes Outreach Center a bit more with uh, publicity and, and if they need um, more food donations, we're certainly front and center to help with that. So that was the library board's response with a bit of editorializing from me as well as a Lions Club member, a community member, and a variety of other hats that I wear as, as many of you do. So thank you for your time. Happy to have any questions if you have any. I think you've had a lot of information today. Appreciate the time. Thank you very much, Carol. Any uh, questions? Yes, Peter? Motion to receive the delegation. Motion to receive. Harry, yes, okay, thank you. All in favor? Okay, good. Now we have a letter here from the OPP where we will bring that up at all or? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor Windermere, that's the next item on the agenda. Um, it's just for council's information. Oh, okay, okay. Not on that agenda. I don't know, okay. Oh, oh, right there, yeah, down here. Okay, sorry, okay, yeah. Okay, then. So business arising out of the previous meeting, then? Of a previous meeting? So we got this. Is the business? Mm -hmm. So is it more than just the police of community detachment? Eh? Or, oh, Chris, okay, yes, right, yes, okay, detachment. Well, it's just, it's a letter from the OPP, right? You were, yeah, we're bringing up, okay. Any comments on this? Carol, anyone? No, no, I think so. they were very clear in terms of what their uh, concerns were about the location, proposed location. Um, 
And even though they're very respectful of the need for supporting a community, um, I think the letter speaks for itself. So I yeah. just make a motion to receive. Okay. Peter, I yes. A motion. Okay. Second by Peter. Okay, then. Uh, Going to uh, favor. Call for the vote. Pardon? Call. Oh, sorry, Peter. Call for the vote, I think. Call for the vote. Okay, sure. Is that the motion for the, not, not for the OPP thing, is this for the motion for the, right? Do I understand what the motion is? Yeah, I do. I, I think Councillor Armstrong made a motion to receive the OPP's supplement food supply program response, and Councillor Franzen seconded it. We yeah. need to vote on that motion. Oh, that one. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I'm in favor. I think they're just waiting for you to say all in favor. Pardon? Okay. All in favor? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we go to the mayor's food supply program. I would like to put, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Sure, <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Mayor. Yeah, I would like to put this notice of this motion forward so we can uh, discuss it and vote on it today. Um, I think it's on everybody's screen. I'll skip all the whereas is the uh, proposal through the motion is that council support the food support program and further that council direct staff to work with the OPP to draft an agreement with the OPP, municipality of Trent Lakes and the Lions Club to bring this much needed program to our municipality. So I'd like to move it just so we can open the discussion and have a vote. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll second it for discussion purposes. Okay. Discussion? Yes, sir. I, I think this motion was very, very emotional for our mayor. I think uh, when you receive all the information from all the different people, there may not be a need for this, but if there is, I certainly would not want to miss anyone needing food security. I think the location is the problem for most members of council and, and, and most members of the public. I think the location is just not fit this program. I think this program as a pilot might be quite necessary. And I think you'll learn from that and that could support the Trent Lakes, Lakes Outreach Center, not be in competition. I think there is opportunity there for to work together rather than apart. The location, I don't think the location is right. So in that regards, I wouldn't support the motion as it is put forward. Yes. Uh, uh, I, I would agree with uh, Terry, because uh, food insecurity is a huge issue all across this country, and uh, I, I certainly would support a, a support service, but not in that location. Yes, I'll have to, I'll have to agree with you. I, I do think we need it. It's just a matter of location. It's not right. Uh, so anyway. So, Call for the vote. Yeah. Okay, oh, yeah, uh, call the vote. Sorry. Uh, uh, request a recorded vote. Okay, sure. If we're ready for the vote, then, uh, sure. Councillor Franzen, are you in favor? No. Councillor Lambsett? No. Not as presented. Deputy Mayor Windover? No, not the way it is. Councillor Armstrong? No. Okay, Carrie, yeah, no. That, that motion failed. No, oh, that, oh, oh, yeah, okay. The motion failed. Okay, then. So, Deputy Mayor. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd like to move a motion that that, uh, that speaks to the motion that just failed. Okay, sure. What motion? That, that council directs the staff to prepare a letter to the OPP stating that there will be no changes to the OPP operation out of the library building and a CC copy to the uh, Lions Club of Buckhorn. I'll second okay. that motion. Okay. Okay, on favor? Carry. Okay. Good. Okay, okay. So, 
Now I guess we go to 12.3. Okay, who's put it on that? Donna? Well, thank you and through you, back to me. Uh, so at the February 1st regular council meeting, council did receive a presentation from Gallagher Benefit Services Group. And that presentation was in relation to a council and non-union market review. So on February the 15th, council approved the new salary grids for the non-union staff. And this report today is requesting direction on the council remuneration review considerations presented at that February 1st meeting. So as you uh, will see, I have provided some options for council to consider today, or of course they could choose their own options. But so the first one would be to uh, approve the recommendations or suggestions in the report from Gallagher, effective April the 1st, and those are listed there for you. It would be adopting a pay policy that aligns council remuneration to the 50th percentile, maintaining the base remuneration for the deputy mayor and council at the current rates, applying the annual adjustment as approved for the non-union salary increases to all elected, elected officials beginning with the 2022 adjustments and thereafter, uh, changing the mileage rate to look at the Canada Revenue Agency instead of the National Joint Council rate, which is what we currently use, which is updated quarterly, establishing a per diem for the attendance at conferences and workshops at $135 a day or $68 for half a day, and conducting an external market review once per term of council to assess comparability of the base remuneration. Option two could be um, those same provisions, but effective with the new term of council, which would be November 15th, or council could elect to implement some or none of the measures identified. So staff are just looking for direction from council how they would want to proceed with that review. Comments? Yes, sir. Uh, my comment, so it may be a motion, is uh, to maintain the status quo with no changes. Yes. Second. I'm second that. Okay. All in favor? Two comments, Terry? I, through you, I, I think the mileage issue for certain members of council yeah. is a is a big issue. There's a lot of kilometers put on depending on which committees you're on that you're wearing out a vehicle that doesn't get anywhere near compensated at 54 cents a kilometer. I mean, 68 might be as a little, I mean, so whatever the, the, the county revenue agency one is, it's normally a little different. It's normally a little increased, not a lot, but quite often is increased. So it, it does help compensate for the wear and tear sure. of the vehicle on Trent Lakes roads. I, I would like to have seen that be included in that motion. Okay. Yeah. I, I'd accept the friendly amendment. No, I would second that. Yes, I think that'd be very good because the price, the price of fuel, mm -hmm. the price is now is unbelievable. Uh, do we not though increase it as accordingly as the as the price of stuff goes up? Isn't it now marry an increase? Yes. Well, yes. Yeah. So thank you and through you. So the National Joint Council rate that we currently use is updated quarterly and is currently fifty seven cents a kilometer, yeah. and the twenty twenty two. Um, rate under the CRA is 61 cents a kilometer for the first 5,000 kilometers. Okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. Perhaps if I may, um, Councillor Franz and that amendment, um, are you intending that the increase or the move oh. to the Canada Revenue Agency rate um, happen immediately or effective with the new council? Uh, immediately. I immediately. Yeah. Yeah, I think we'll have that. Just one question for that. I'm sorry yeah. through you. I don't know that that's budgeted for this year. I, I would more think that 2022 would be a more appropriate time to change that rate. Yeah. So I, I think we've got our budget, we've got our mileage all figured out for, for 2021, sorry, for 2022. 
But once the new council is elected, I think that's when that change should happen. And I would withhold my second unless we make it for November 2022 for that sure. reason. Yeah, okay. Okay. But it is that just quarterly, so it's going to have some impact in our on our budget sure. in the next quarter. Yeah, two months, maybe minimum. Yeah. Okay, so are we voting on that? Or? Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Yeah, carry. Okay, good. Okay. So. So are we at the 12.4 now again? Okay. Comments? I think that this is a, a, a great idea. I don't think that the entire amount of the the budget that the mayor has for the is intended for that one specific project. I think probably a percentage of that amount would be appropriate because it is a well a well needed thing. So I, I think it's important to help su support that. But the entire amount, I think there might be some more other people in our municipality that are going to need some of that. So okay. I would support probably 2,000 of it, but not anymore. So you're making a motion in no, 2,000 just, maybe? That was just a comment. I think we need more. I guess I would have a little different perspective. Yeah. Um, and you weren't here last time, Councilor Lance said, but I mean, two things. One, there's we pointed out there's some very unfortunate wording in this notice of motion because it's not the mayor's money, it's taxpayer money that's been budgeted for the purposes of her carrying out her duties. Um, and the second comment was that this comes just after we had a, a full day meeting to make our community grant awards. And this was one of the applicants and why we would go back and award one of the applicants an additional 3000 after we spent all that time vetting each of them and ranking them. It, to me, just makes a complete mockery of that process. So at this time, given we still have, what's today, March? <laughs> yeah, we still have 10 months or eight months um, in the year. I think at this time we do nothing with that $3,000. So I would like to make this motion as it stands uh, so that we can bring it forward and vote on it. I'll, I'll second the motion for discussion purposes. Okay. Vote. Anyway. Hey, Terry, you got comments? In a minute. Pardon? Yeah, yeah. I, I still maintain that that like it's it's for the Buckhorn Public School playground equipment, right? It's, I mean that's it's again that's a that's an important thing for me. I mean there's that's a that's a good thing to do for our community. So I, I do understand that they didn't follow the right rules and we denied that large of an amount, but I still would support a percentage of that going to work. What percentage would you mean there? I, I, I even 50 percent. But 50 percent? Yeah, that's 1500 dollars. It's it's going to go a long way to getting that into that area where it's been removed. That's my opinion. Well, I guess I'd support your <laughs> that, but anyway. My yes. my original thought because the, the mayor had indicated uh, that that was going to be used for the volunteers for a luncheon or a dinner uh, was that why don't we send out a, a gift card of 20 or 25 dollars to our volunteers in appreciation and uh, make the message that we're coming out of COVID and uh, hopefully we're going to be back to normal soon. Yes, sir. Thank you. And if I can add to that, Again, we've got eight more months left. Mm -hmm. um, it's possible that there could be a volunteer appreciation dinner, just as we had used it before in the past. So yeah. my preference is to just hold on to the three thousand at this point in time, and you know perhaps there's another organization that is in desperate need of that money because we no longer have a surplus in our community uh, award fund. Um, right. At this point, I would prefer to pass on it. I'd like to call for the vote. 
So where are we standing? You're making the motion. I'm making the motion, motion as it stands. Yeah. And I'd like a recorded vote. So, okay, so what, what's the motion exactly? As it reads. Yeah, it reads. Whereas the pandemic has prevented, <clears throat> excuse me, has prevented me from using my $3,000 to have a volunteer dinner, and whereas the Buckhorn Public School was trying to raise money to replace their play structure, now therefore that council approved transferring the balance of the $3,000 to the Buckhorn Public School fundraising campaign. You want to make that motion? They do that. Make the motion so that we can vote on it. Yes. I'm bad. Okay. Wait, I, let me explain that. You want to make a motion that we do what? That we keep it. I'm just putting the motion on the floor. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That doesn't mean I need to. No, no, it. I know. We're yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And presented and we're going to vote on it. Yep. I just got to make sure I know. Yes, Donna. So, thank you and through you. I think I should clarify um, that the intention from this motion, it's my understanding, is to use the money unspent from 2021. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was thinking too. Sorry, I just want to make sure it's because there was some confusion. Uh, it's currently in reserves. Any surplus money goes there. So I think that was the intention that this would be taken from the 2021 unspent funding. Right. And that the 2022 monies would remain for for 2022 initiatives. And that's what you're, you're saying that that okay. Yeah. Now I am confused. Exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. That's yes, sir. When I had my idea of fifty percent or two thousand dollars, that was I was assuming from the mayor's allotment for twenty twenty one money, not twenty twenty two money. Right. Yeah. And I was assuming we're talking current year dollars because last year's dollar last year is put to bed. <laughs> well not hers. Put to bed, the books not are that closed and it's been audited. Something. So so thank you and through you. It is unusual to spend it the following year. Mm -hmm. I think that this motion came forward kind of in the middle of the two years. So that is maybe where the confusion lies, but it isn't usually considered at this time to spend money from the previous year. But that would be the way to spend it, is my message. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Terry. So for me, yes. my perspective is I'm still going to support part of that money from 2021 yes. going to that equipment. 2022, I would not support any of that money going to that equipment. That is a new, we're in a new budget cycle. We're in a new dollar amounts I, I think because it's in reserve a little bit of it can certainly help and go a long way to helping some people okay so i my motion was with the assumption that it's 2022 dollars oh yeah so no. i would either withdraw that motion yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's i wonder in favor of another one or keep the motion and proceed to vote on it and since we don't have clarification from the person who <laughs> presented it in the first that, place. That, that's just, okay. So you made the motion, Terry, that we would spend the no, money I, from I, the There is 20... a motion on the floor that we yep. approve the $3,000. We need to vote on that motion or have it removed from the floor. I'll leave it on. Hello, Terry. Perhaps you just wanted to amend it slightly either way to either say 2022 funds or 20, 2021? I would like to, but... I'd like to keep it either. Yeah. Keep either one of them, mm -hmm. 21 and 22. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so we have a, close, a vote on that then? Yep. So you second it, right, Peter? Yes, I did. Okay, so we vote on... Both you said both of them okay. All in favor of your motion? 
Okay. Okay. Council, 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 council Armstrong has requested a recorded vote. So okay. if we're ready for the vote. Councilor Armstrong, are you in favor? No. Councilor Franzen? No. Councilor Lambshead? No. Deputy Mayor Wendover? No. That motion has failed. Okay, now before we move on, then, is it possible to make a motion we? now to okay. donate some of that 2021 to that? I mean, just a, I think we've denied it, so I think we've denied it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can revisit it in a few months. What are you saying, Peter? There, there. I, I was going to make a motion, but I think we've visited it, we've seen it, we've talked yeah. about it. I think we've made our decision. We'll move on. Okay, so we continue. Can we have a five minute break? Any chance? Sure, yes, okay. Let's have a break. <laughs> Okay, so Public Works 13 1. Jessica, Mr. Carpenter, GA. Thank you, and through you, sorry, I don't have the agenda. If someone could just let me know which report that is. <laughs> oh, waste and recycling. Waste and recycling. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you, and through you, Deputy Mayor Wendover. Annually, I provide council with an overview of the previous year's waste and recycling initiatives and comparison data. This report is the 2021 waste and recycling summary for your information. Thank you. Oh, okay. Good. Did we see that? Comments? Motion to receive. Okay. Thank you. Second. Peter? You're seconding it? Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah. Okay. One, oh, sorry. One little comment. I, it's nice to see that there's been some mattresses received at sites. That that program seemed to work a bit. Thank you for that. Thank you, Can Councillor Lamb said yes. They were very successful, and um, there are two more events planned for this year. Perfect. Good. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Carrie, can you receive it? Did we vote? Not to, are we all in favor? Yeah, all in favor, yeah. Okay. Uh, next one, I guess, Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Mayor Wendover and through you. Staff have created a replacement mailbox policy as there is not currently one in place. On occasion, resident mailboxes may be damaged as a result of municipal operations. A replacement mailbox policy has been developed to formalize the process of replacing damaged mailboxes for consistency and transparency. Thank you. Comments? Yes. A motion to support. To support? About, about yeah. policy. Okay, yes. Second with a comment. Um, I missed it the first time through, as Chelsea knows. Yeah. Um, but I was concerned because the notice of a, a damaged mailbox uh, needed to be submitted within 48 hours of the damage. And I raised the concern that some people aren't up here yeah, right. <laughs> every 48 yeah. hours. But Chelsea did point out that it, it gives provision for a report received after that time with an explanation. So thank you for helping me out and understanding that. Jesse. Okay. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Okay. Next one, please, Jim. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Wendover, and through you. A report has been prepared for Council regarding waste cards for municipally owned buildings. The report outlines municipal owned buildings as well as the current method of waste disposal that is in place for that particular building. Staff are looking for direction from council on a waste disposal process for municipally owned buildings. Thank you. 
Okay. Comments? Sorry. Which? Okay, Carol. Uh, th thank you uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. I was going to uh, propose the motion that we uh, uh, opt for option two, which is providing each municipally owned building with a waste card. Then they're all consistent, and it looks like the majority of them already have a waste card. So I think that's the simplest, most efficient, consistent way to, to proceed. Yes, sir. I'll second that motion for option number yeah. two. Okay. All in favor? Yes. Okay. Carry. Thank you. If I may, can I provide or just ask for a little bit of clarification? And I apologize. I, I should have maybe put this in my report. But would council like to suspend what is currently happening at these sites? For example, there are some facilities or buildings that uh, receive pickup from our public works department as well as receive a waste card. So is it council's direction to move forward with just providing these buildings with a, a waste card? Oh, man. I would still think they should be picked up for the public works if they do. Yes. I, I, I think that there are some areas that like the library where it should be picked up because yeah. otherwise uh, our employees are going to have to put it in the back of their car. Definitely. Oh, yeah, sure. That, that doesn't make much sense. Yes. I, mean, I don't think the motion spoke to anything other than like whatever the roads and department and parks and rec are doing now continue to do so. I think we spoke to just the waste cards at each of the sites. I think you just continue status quo for the whatever you're doing yeah. other than the cards. If they don't have a, yeah, if there is a municipal that doesn't have a waste card and doesn't get it picked up to give them one. Yes. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I would think, you know. Yeah. Because it seems like there is some that doesn't maybe have anything they're using their own, maybe. Right? Is that right, Judd? Through you, Deputy Mayor Wendover, there are some instances where uh, residents are using their own card um, mm -hmm. for a municipal owned building to dispose of the garbage and recycling. Um, and as my report indicates, there are some other sites as well that do receive a waste card. However, public work staff also pick up the waste from those buildings on occasion. So just trying to tidy up this process again for consistency. So, okay. Through you, Deputy Mayor uh, Windover. So Chelsea, the option that was presented to us only spoke to the waste cards. So do you have a recommendation regarding picking up garbage from municipal buildings that council can review and make a decision on. So through you, the options presented for council um, were for council to take into consideration. The table in my report was just identifying what the current method of waste disposal is. So um, I think it would be my understanding that should council choose to give a municipally owned facility a waste card that they would then be responsible for their own waste disposal. However, that's up for council's consideration. Um, as I mentioned, there are a little bit of inconsistencies in uh, waste disposal practices in place right now. So just looking to see what council's direction is and what they would like to see. I mean, if council wishes to do a mixture, you know, where certain um, buildings receive pickup from public works and other buildings that are a little bit um, mm -hmm. more unique receive a waste card, then council can choose to do so. Yes. I think that sounds good. You know, what do you think? That yes, would be, that would be my preference. That yeah, that, that that where we pick up the garbage that that remains and to the other facilities get the waste carts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Seconder. Does that give you clarification enough? Go ahead, Peter. So, well, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of particular buildings like the yeah. library, uh, like our medical centers. We certainly can't expect uh, the staff of uh, the doctors and uh, secretaries to be taking the garbage to a landfill. But no. 
I mean, that should be picked up by our staff. We do snow plowing and maintenance on those buildings anyway, so they're, the, yeah. it shouldn't be an issue to pick up the garbage from those facilities. So the ones that are getting it done now should keep on just being able to keep, keep on, on doing, doing it. Yes. And the other ones can get a waste cart if they need yep. it. Yeah. Like the community centers probably need a waste cart because they produce most of their waste after a particular function. Mm -hmm. And their 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 waste on an ongoing basis would be very limited. Yeah, because some of me with a waste car can use more than that 48 tags, eh? You know, as I'm concerned about maybe. Yeah. You get a big party or something, you get quite a few bikes. They they also make income from the the, <clears throat> the function. Yeah. So, you know, that could be part of the cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. Dollar or two dollars is a thing for a bag, so that's a big issue. So can we call for the vote on that motion that uh, Council Branson put forward? Okay, Chair. Sorry, through you, Deputy Mayor. Oh, can I just confirm with Council yeah. Branson <laughs> what motion he made? Is it just to maintain the existing pickup at locations that are currently provided? Yeah, and, okay. and yeah. provide cards to uh, other ones, other locations. If I may, I, I'm not sure we need that addendum because we only yeah. dealt with waste cards. I, so maybe just pick up some. I, I think as long as it's clarified, it doesn't matter how many motions we make. <laughs> as long as staff knows where count, what council is. Uh. Okay. So it's second and everyone, okay. okay. All in favor? Okay, carried, yes. Okay, building and planning then. Oh no, well, no, Steve. Yeah, recreation, none. Fire and emergency, Steve. Thank Service. you, Deputy Mayor Wendover. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, which one are we on here? Uh, the first uh, report through you, Deputy Mayor Wendover, to Council is just uh, for information purposes and uh, 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 thank you has been sent out to uh, Jeff and Sheila Cheshire for a kind donation of $2,000 towards the fire department that we will uh, kindly put towards our training as you'll see the pattern in my, one of my other reports coming forward. Good. Next one. Motion to receive. Deputy Mayor, you want to make a I would like to make a motion to receive that from Steve. Council received the donation recognition report for information purposes and to thank the Cheshire's very much for their donation. Okay. There, second. Your second, Peter. Okay, all in favor? Carried. Okay, thank you. Okay, Thank you, Deputy Mayor Windover. Through you, Council, um, before you have my second report, which is a recommendation uh, looking for approval for a single source procurement to have our community risk assessment uh, that I have briefed you on previous um, to get that process started uh, due to the mandatory certification stuff that's coming down the pipes. So um, instead of reading all this, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Questions? Yes. I would make uh, the motion to approve the single source procurement for the uh, community risk assessment to be done by emergency management group, given that we have a very short time frame, um, and also direct the funds from the service delivery reverse reserve sorry, to be used for that purpose. Okay, second, Chair. All in favor? Carried. Okay, thank you. Casey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Went over through you to Council. Um, this is 
regarding the mandatory certification uh, regulations. Um, cutoff date was February 28th um, after a, a short 30 day window for um, any sort of consultation. Um, as well, you've been uh, briefed on this prior. Um, my recommendation is that council does not support the mandatory certification as uh, proposed. Um, and below is listed some, some of our reasons why. Um, and also that AMO has put a three page report forward to the minister. The Ontario Association of Fire Chiefs have put a 130 page report forward and Trent Lakes Fire has sent six pages of comments as well. So I have left it to council's decision whether this they would like this forwarded and or um, vote on a delegation to the Good Roads because we've missed our that 20 the 30th day of the, or the 28th day of the month. Sorry, um, but all of these um, comments and concerns have been forwarded through to the minister and through our board of uh, directors at our fire college and our Ontario Association of Fire Chiefs as well. So if there's any questions with regards to that, um, we could speak about this all day. There's lots mm -hmm. to talk about, but if there's any questions. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I just want to say that I'd like to move that uh, we support the recommendations made by our fire chief. Okay. Terry, you second it? I have a second that with a little comment. I, comment? I think we're not alone in this. No. no. There's a lot of other municipalities that will lose a lot of their fire services and have to be do something different if this continues in its present form without funding from the province or the federal government. For sure. And through, through you, Deputy Mayor, went over to Council. Um, I agree, Councillor Lambs had the the concern for me is the the past tense. Moving forward, we can um, adapt to almost any situation with time and money, but the, the hardest factor, I believe, will be people, the volunteer. Um, that's the hard part. Okay, thank you. Yes, sorry. Thank you for your Deputy Mayor Wendover to Councillor Franzen, you moved yes. the motion? Yes, I did. Um, uh, Steve is also looking for direction on whether to forward the contents of this report to the Solicitor General and whether to request a delegation at OGRA. Do you want to include both of those things? Yes, or? I do. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And the second or what? I should know this. Terry. Terry. Thank you. And and <coughs> well, no, the yeah. AMO if it's still a valid time, I would certainly like to take that to AMO too. And if I could just add through you, Deputy Mayor, uh, if we could send a copy of this report to AMO. Yeah. Okay, we have that approved. Yeah. Great. Carry in. Just call for the vote. Yeah, call the call the vote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In favor. <coughs> well, I guess actually we got you now. Yes. Huh? Thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor Windover. <coughs> At the February first, twenty twenty two meeting, Council directed the short term rental working group to use the short-term rental survey and public consultation session results and bring forward a recommendation, which is contained in this report. The working group spent considerable time reviewing all of the public input and feedback on the proposal was very polarized and both sides expressed strong opinions. The working group acknowledges it is difficult to develop a proposal that incorporates all these diverse perspectives. After much discussion and deliberation, the working group has made considerable modifications to its proposal and it's proposing a multi-year plan for council review and approval. While it will not meet everyone's preferred solution, the working group believes it addresses the largest concerns of both groups and provides a roadmap for managing the issues that arise from short-term rentals. The highlights of the proposal are for phase one in 2022, a review of existing bylaws, including an adjustment of fines, escalators, and extension of accountability to owners, engagement of OPP to further assist in after hours bylaw enforcement, a review of the Port Guard processes and practices for bylaw enforcement, a review of the call center currently tasked processes and reporting, 
staff to follow up with repeat offenders, the conversation and warning letters, development and general mail out of a short-term rental information document, bylaws, enforcement, recommended guidelines and best practices, explore other after hours bylaw enforcement options and track and report on short-term rental complaints. Phase two in 2023 would be to budget for enhanced bylaw administration and enforcement, introduce a comprehensive new nuisance bylaw, implement an administrative monetary penalty or AMP system for non-parking offenses, possible changes to bylaw enforcement, and possible engagement of third party to prepare a curated list of short-term rentals in Trent Lakes. Phase three for 2024, council would revisit the implementation of a short-term rental licensing program and budget for and add staff as necessary to support any new programs. The recommendation today is to receive the report to approve the recommendations of the working group for a phased approach, direct staff to implement the working group recommendations for 2022, and thank the members of the working group and dissolve the committee. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I would like to make a motion to support all of that. I, I think this has been a very, very big project for that working group, and I really commend everyone on that committee. I think you've done a fantastic job. You've you've listened to our, our rate payers, you've just listened to council and you've worked between yourselves and all the groups in this community. And I think you've come up with a very comprehensive solution moving forward. Yes. I'll second that motion. You second it, okay. Uh, I'll second that motion with a comment. Yeah. I would like to thank Carol Armstrong for all the work that she's done on that committee. She was there from day one and fought through and saw that it was all completed. She she honestly did the lion's share of the work from members of council. Uh, staff was also so instrumental on uh, on setting up that policy. It was a, a lot of hard work. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. You may. Okay. All in favor? Approved. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. Building and planning. Then. Oh, we are. No, we have to get, get that done now. Okay. Uh, Adele. Yes, thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor Windover. Uh, this report is regarding the county official plan update. And on January 24th, the County of Peterborough's draft official plan was released for public and agency review and comments. The official plan is proposed to replace the county's existing official plan and is intended to serve as a local official plan for area municipalities. The new county OP will contain policies which are consistent across the county, while the local component would be specific to each township, and it's also included in the overall uh, county OP. Over the last several years, planning staff have participated in the draft OP update as part of TAC, the Technical Advisory Committee, and staff periodically have provided counsel with updates regarding various issues that were being addressed. The official plan review being undertaken not only serves as a municipal comprehensive review, but also a conformity exercise with respect to provincial policy and recent changes to the Planning Act. The draft document is not complete as timelines set out in the Planning Act require the release of the document in its current form in the interest of meeting the July 1st deadline for growth plan conformity. There are two outstanding items remaining, which one is the growth analysis and land needs assessment is currently being undertaken by Hempson Consulting and the implementation of a natural heritage system as required by the growth plan. There are many new policies being introduced and have been outlined in this report, such as affordable housing to include tiny homes and secondary dwelling units. Once the county official plan is approved, the municipality will be required to undertake a comprehensive review of the current zoning bylaw to bring this document in conformity to the new official plan. 
The staff report outlines a number of items that are specific to Trent Lakes and staff will request that they be included in the draft OP. The public has been inquiring about increasing the circulation notification distance for quarries. This is not an OP policy, however, better addressed by updating our existing public notice policy. In the coming weeks, the county has scheduled a series of open houses, which planning staff will be participating and they're also listed in the report, um, the dates in which these public open houses will be occurring. Deputy Mayor Windover, it is being recommended that council receive this report regarding the county official plan update for information and further that council provide any additional comments and that staff forward these comments as well as this report to the County of Peterborough for consideration and further that council consider amending policy 5.10 appendix A to increase the circulation notice area for quarries and that concludes the report I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? No okay fair enough. Uh, yeah the increase in uh uh, the circulation notices, uh, how much would that expand the circulation? Through you, Deputy Mayor Windover. Um, this I understand I will bring forward a report because this is sort of separate from the OP review and update that the report hinges on. I was just advising that we've received additional comments. I would consider bringing forward a report at a later date, just dealing with the increase to the circulation notice. And I was just bringing it to council's attention that I have received comment and people would like to see it increase from the 500 meters currently to maybe even a kilometer. So I don't know the appropriateness of the increase to the circulation, but we will do some research and bring forward a report in the future for council's consideration to amend that policy. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, yes. Uh, um, then let me propose the motion that council receive this report regarding the county official plan update, that we provide any additional comments and that staff forward these comments as well as this report to the county for consideration and further, I'm going to amend this, the council requests staff to bring forward a report on policy five, uh, incorporating any uh, input from our residents. Second that motion. Second, okay. Call for the vote. Approved, okay, good. Okay, Sarah, 13-4-3. Thank you through you, Deputy Mayor. On today's agenda, there is a municipal appraisal form for consent file B-16-22, submitted by the owner, Douglas Wilkins. The subject land is located at 1252 Buckhorn Lake, Island 125. The application conforms to the official plan as the intent of the severance is to create a parking easement in favor of the neighboring island, 1202 Buckhorn Lake, Island 120. The land subject to the consent application is already being utilized as a parking area to access the owner's island property. Staff have reviewed the application and recommend that council supports the proposed severance. Thank you. Comments? Questions? No? Okay. Make a motion if you'd like. Terry, motion, okay. motion to approve it is two, presented there. Three. I think that's a yeah. simple solution to access to their properties. Okay. Second by Peter. You want to talk, comment, Peter? No, I have no comment. Okay. Vote. Okay. Okay. Great. Carried. Thank you. So finances now, Donna. Thank you, and through you. Uh, before you is the annual financial statement as required under Bill 73. So I'm looking for council to receive the statement and direct that the statement be made available to the public through the municipality's website as required under the act. When 
Motion to support. Motion to support, okay. Second, Carol, yes, okay. All in favor, carry. Thank you. Next one, Donna. So, Bye, two. Thank you, and through you, uh, council table for February 2022. Any comments, any questions? I'll make a motion to receive. Okay, Terry. I'll second that with a comment that it's it's very okay. nice to see that we're doing a lot more payments electronically. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay, all in favor? Carry. Thank you. Ron, I'm going to remove myself from the chambers. Pardon? I'm going to remove myself from the chambers because oh, well, we're discussing fine, yeah. Alpine Village and Iris Glen. Right on. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, okay. Mr. Hughes. Uh, so before you is the annual reporting as required under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, so I can tell council that Aqua will be coming to uh, present to council on April the 5th. So any questions relating to this reporting can be asked then. But yes, for your information to be received. And once again, that uh, direct staff to provide a copy of these reports and these to the associations as well and post them on the municipal website. Okay. Make that a motion. Okay, Carrie, Carol. I'll second. Okay. Good enough. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah. I'll vote on proof. I missed the call for a vote. Oh, yeah, call for vote. Yeah. Okay, approved. Okay. So I guess we can get someone back. You went long away, John. <laughs> okay, okay. Corporate services, Jesse. Thank you, through you, Deputy Mayor Windover. At the January 11th, 2022 meeting of council, Council directed staff to proceed with the application from Patrick Casey to purchase the unopened road allowance adjacent to their property. Notice was given in accordance with the disposal of real property policy and no comments from uh, the public have been received. Uh, uh, Patrick Casey will be required to provide a survey and obtain at least one appraisal of the fair market value of the land. The recommendation today is that council receive the report, declare the unopened road allowance surplus to the needs of the municipality authorize the stop up and closure of the unopened road allowance and authorize the sale to the adjacent landowner being Patrick Casey and authorize the mayor and clerk to execute any documents that may be necessary to affect the sale of the subject property. Okay. Motion, please. Terry, yes. Motion to approve as recommended. Second by Peter. Okay. Motion, yeah. I'll carry. Well, all in favor? Carry. Yeah. Okay. Gary. Fourth one for information. What's the yes? Uh, yeah, I, I, I would like to uh, uh, take out the ones dealing with uh, the mandatory fire uh, certification. I think we should support them all. Support them all, okay. Any second or what? Sorry. Sorry, to you, Deputy Mayor Windover, just for clarification. Um, the fire chief has submitted comments on behalf of Trent Lakes to the Fire Association. Um, and the contents of the report that was on the agenda earlier uh, will be forwarded to the um, ministry and AMO as well. 
I just thought this might reinforce our position. I realize the fire chief has a bill in hand, but uh, I think that's such an important issue and just an impact to our fire service that we should uh, support the, their recommendations. And if that's a motion, I would second that. Second that motion. Support. Okay. Oh, and so we're going to receive all the rest of the information. Receive, all. receive it and then. No, I, oh. I've only dealt with this. Okay. This one. So someone making a motion to receive them all, and you're making a motion that. No, no, I just made a motion uh, uh, to uh, to respond to the ones dealing with the fire service. Yes. With the mandatory uh, certification. Mm -hmm. and, and I second that. It. I think we all, all we have to do is vote on it. Carol second to that. Okay. Favor. No. Okay. Carried. Okay, yes. I'll make a motion to receive all of the uh, rest of the correspondence okay. for information. Okay. Second it there is? Yes. yes. No. Okay. All in favor? Carry. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> So we're in correspondent of action, right? Jim? Yeah, okay. Municipality of Yes. Motion to receive the correspondence from the municipality of Shunia. Okay. Second, but here. Okay, Peter. All in favor? Carry. Motion to receive the correspondence from Peter Julia. Okie dokie. Okay. Second by Carol. Okay. All in favor? Yeah. Carry. Okay. Next one. So, yeah. I would make a motion to support the uh, correspondence regarding hospital capital funding. I will second that motion. I think it's very who important did, to support it. Gary, you? Gary? Yes, okay, yeah. yeah. Favor? Carried? Okay, next one. Receive yeah. the here of the garden for information purposes. Make that motion. Okay. I'd second. Okay. All in favor? Carry. Motion to support uh, uh, Salwin's uh, Gypsy Ma. Yeah. Program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely so. Yeah. Second. So we should. Uh, Support in a big way, that's for sure, yes. Okay, all in favor? Carrie? It's, it's just a comment on that one. Pardon? Oh, yeah? So we have had a very cold winter, so hopefully a lot of the gypsy moth eggs will not survive, and this problem may be solved in itself. Be great, itself. yeah. Apparently, if it's 20 below zero, a lot of the moths die. A lot of them. What's that, Peter? Apparently, if it's 20 below zero, it kills the larva or whatever oh, from yeah. the mob. Oh, we had that once or twice, yeah. Yeah, we've had uh, quite a bit of cold weather this winter, yeah. so mm -hmm. it might yeah. help. Let's hope they're all dead. <laughs> We've already paid to get mine sprays. <laughs> anyway, okay. Next in 15 and 6. Comes with motion section. to receive. Receive it, eh? Okay. Second. Okay. All in favor? Great. Okay. Bylaws. 
Thank you. Sorry. Yep, through yeah. you, Deputy Mayor Windover, there are several agenda or several bylaws on today's agenda that didn't have their a corresponding staff report or part of a public meeting. The first is bylaw B 2022-17, which is to authorize the execution of an animal control services agreement with the Humane Society, which staff were directed to negotiate at the February 15th meeting. Uh, bylaws B 2022, 19, 20, 21, and 22 are four zoning bylaw amendments for the Oak Orchard sub plan of condominium. An interim control bylaw was passed on June 1st, 2021, and a public meeting was held on March 1st, 2022. And B 2022-23 is a bylaw to amend the site plan control area to include low density residential housing. And this again corresponds to the Oak Orchard plan of condominium. Okay. Any comments? Yes. I would make a motion to approve the uh, Animal Control Services Agreement mm -hmm. and also thank Matt for um, mm -hmm. uh, negotiating that so expeditiously. This was really terrific work. Okay. Second. All in favor? Carried. There. Who was the seconder? I didn't hear who. Okay. You. I, I know I had my hand up. I didn't. You. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yes. I would like to make a motion to approve the zoning bylaw amendment file number 2116. It was presented earlier. Okay. Sec. Okay. Second by Peter. Yep. Okay. All in favor? Carry. 16.4. Yes, sir. I would like a to make a motion to approve uh, all five bylaws related to Oak Orchard. So 2022 19, 2022 20, 2021, 2022 22, and 2022 20, 23. Okay. All in favor? Second you second me here? You second, Peter? Yeah. Okay, all in favor? Carry. I just want a small okay. comment there. I would like to thank staff and everyone that's been involved with this. This has been a huge undertaking by all parties. Yes. And this is, we think and we hope that this, these bylaws and zoning bylaw amendments will be a benefit to all the parties concerned. Let's hope that moving forward. Thank you. Well said. I, I'd like to make a comment as well. Uh, this is going to be viewed from municipalities across Canada, mm -hmm. and hopefully it'll uh, it'll guide them to do it the right way. I just want to thank Adele and Barb very much for this very hard, very lot of work. Yep, mm -hmm. a lot of work for sure. Okay, no one knows the motion. Okay, eighteen point one. Yes. Yeah, as Deputy Mayor Windor and myself were in attendance for the County Council meeting, I just wanted to make everyone yes. aware that the development charges is, <laughs> are being reviewed there too. And the background studies show that there could possibly be up to a $2,500 increase in the county's levied development charges. So hopefully we can speak with the county as that progresses and hopefully it doesn't, ha it doesn't have to be all implemented in a year. It is possible and their documentation shows it is Possible. Thank you. Yes, it's quite a thing. And 14th, we've got another day in it. Just, just a quick question. Yeah. What's the percentage increase then? I think it's like 20%, very close to 20%, mm. or something like that. It, it sits around less than 8,500 now, and it'll possibly could go to about 10,800. For new development, it doesn't have to. That is at the discretion of county council. May I also ask, through you, Deputy Mayor, um, is there a final budget for the county, and what percentage increase in the tax rate that would represent? Uh, I don't believe it's final yet, but not it's final. very close. I'm not sure. I wasn't in attendance for that meeting. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Council President. <laughs> I thought you were the fount of all information county-wide. Well, it was a heads up, I would have been. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. 
Okay. So we're going to close session then, or? Motion to go and close. Motion to go, yeah, come out. Second that motion. Okay. And like to comment, we, we need yes. to read that it's to discuss personal matters about an identifiable in individual, All right. including no, municipal sorry. or local board employees, mm -hmm. uh, and labor relations or employment negotiations. Okay, we're on close now. Oh, <laughs> motion to approve. Carried, thanks. Okay, now we have a adoption of the minutes. Rise and close second. Rise and close second. Okay, yeah. Who makes second that? There. Okay. Your in favor. Good. Okay. Business arising out of the closed meeting. The adoption of the minutes from February fifteenth. Yeah. Okay. Adoption of the minutes. I'll move to adopt them. Okay. Peter, okay. All in favor? Carry. Okay. Confirming bylaw. We'll move to adopt the confirming bylaw. Hmm? We'll move to adopt the confirming bylaw. Okay. I'll second. Carol. All in favor? Pass. No, that other thing. Adjournment. Yeah. I also move. Oh, good girl. Yeah. <laughs> You're the only one that does that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Door. Okay. Second it. Okay, fair. All in favor? Good. Carried. We're done.